right. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank, thank you, Philip. <coughs> thank you to everyone for coming along today as well. It's a really great turnout, and I think we've got about 17 engineering institutes um, represented. So that that's that's just fantastic. So where do I begin? I'd like to personally take this moment to thank uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering, um, BP, um, Arrow and Stonewall for putting on that pivotal event in May 2014, Data Driven Diversity, the Facts About Being LGBT in Engineering. That event for me just, um, it, 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 was like, it was like a nail drop. I, I reflected back when I was at university and there was nothing for support for LGBT engineers. Yet if you were LGBT working in finance or law, there were support groups there for you. So I think we've really been missing the picture on this for, for some while. Subsequent to um, that event, I read Lord Brown's book, The Glass Closet, whilst I was on holiday in Mykonos. Um, and this got me impassioned even further. I, so this was in the May, and then this was in the July. And you know, my husband, Sam, was like, oh Mark, God, give it a rest. And I just I had to do something. I had to, had to do something. So these two occurrences um, served as the launch pad for Interengineering, which myself, Tom Wallace, uh, Peter Gracie, and Jason Linford, um, who are also here today, founded. Uh, since our formation in late 2014, we have expanded to over 300 uh, members and continue to grow as we reach out to a wider audience. Our aim is simple, it's to connect, inform, and empower LGBT engineers and supporters, and that's critical. We want to provide resources to engineers who want to champion change from a, grass, from a grassroots level, but who do not know where to start. We want to provide support to small and medium businesses who may not know how to implement diversity initiatives effectively. We aim to achieve this by establishing regional groups and to ensure that we have representation across the UK. I really don't want inter-engineering to be a London-centric event because engineers are employed throughout the UK and internationally. So we need to reach those engineers working on the platforms, those engineers that are about to be sent to caustic countries overseas for LGBT engineers. Um, and we've been very successful in the launch of our Southwest branch, uh, a pilot scale. Um, launch, which John Bradbury is somewhere in the room, he's our co-chair. We're looking at replicating this model across the UK as we grow. So in the spirit of inclusion and by harnessing social media, um, we are able to reach those who are un unable to attend our events. We're endeavouring to have each event captured on film and have added to our YouTube channel. Uh, we plan to recruit campus ambassadors from UK universities to ensure that we are reaching out to LGBT engineering students. There's attrition rate of engineers who currently work in the sector and talent being lost to other sectors. We need to try and rein all that in and not uh, let lack of inclusion be a reason why people are leaving. Um, so this will ensure that engi the engineering sector is promoted as a number one choice um, industry for future LGBT students and the talent will not be lost to other highly numerate industries. We want to leverage our support um, with engineering institutes, companies, and now Parliament to accelerate the journey towards inclusion for both current LGBT engineers and future LGBT engineers. So, Alec got in touch with me um, last year after reading an article in the New Civil Engineer highlighting homophobia in engineering. Now let me just be clear, when I, when I use the word homophobia, I'm meaning homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia, and all forms of um, uh, bigotry that lie around sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, the premise of the report was to look at the productivity on LGBT engineers in the workplace, um, and some fantastic work is being done on this area by Stonewall, which Ruth is representing today, and the human rights campaign in the US. Both organizations continue to run studies on not being out in the workplace and work workplace productivity independent of industry. Our report tries to address an overlooked sector, engineering. And as Philip alluded, data is difficult to get. 
So the more we grow and the more data we can access, the better refined our conclusions can be. So the report. Less inclusive environments have a negative and personal um, have negative personal and economic impact on individuals and businesses respectively. Studies show that there is a 30% loss in productivity for LGBT employees in the less inclusive environments. Over 50% of LG LGBT employees are not out at work. We discovered this in an um, article, in, in a survey that we did at the Institution of Chemical Engineers, and this is also in line with the Human Rights Council date, okay, data. And over 60%, 60% of graduates go back into the closet when they start their first job. That's incredible. I couldn't imagine going back into the closet when I started my first job. Being an engineer and making some assumptions, we estimated that the engineering industry is losing a potential of 11.2 billion pounds due to LGBT engineers remaining in the closet. Now that is a big number, and this government are all about productivity, so anything that we can do in the room to help improve that, that should be good. So today I want to highlight the main recommendations for engineering companies, institutes, and the UK government uh, to implement in order to close this gap. Our recommendations for engineering companies are to establish diversity and inclusion policies, but not just have it on the shelf, but actually bring it to life through some of these subsequent um, uh, recommendations. Have executive leadership support and championship from the top level. Um, set up employee resource groups. Have an LGBT network where people can come together and maybe discuss their problems. Um, introduce role model programs and introduce reverse mentoring. Reverse mentoring is a fantastic way to educate the people in the senior leadership um, on issues that are being faced on the ground and it helps them uh, have their finger on the pulse. And any employee resource group brings together people from different verticals and horizontals in a business and so that increases communication, collaboration, which leads to innovation, which leads to the change that we need to improve productivity. Unconscious bias training, that makes people aware of their um, perceptions or how they may be judging situations um, and then change their behaviour accordingly. Um, ally and support our programmes. Supply chain requirements, this is a very strong mechanism to try and cascade change through the engineering sector. If the core, uh, so I work in the engineering contracting sector, which is what I call the secondary industry. I used to work in a tertiary industry, um, consulting, and I view the operators in oil and gas as being the primary. So they're the ones that have got the money. They're the ones that you know my company want to uh, do business with. If we are having um, diversity and inclusion um, requirements mandated on us or expected of us, then you know nothing gets that pen picked up quicker to start um, instigating change in an organisation than spending cash. So. You know, that's, that's really something that companies should consider. Um, share best practice and flexible working policies for overseas, working overseas, and survey the workforce and collect data to monitor over time. Such an aversion to collect data due to the Data Protection Act, and <coughs> in my own personal opinion, I sometimes think it's a cop-out to actually collecting the data. It, there's no point in embarking on a lot of programs if you're not going to be able to monitor and measure the change and have a benchmark. So, you know, those, those, uh, they need to be overcome, those issues. So that's the engineering companies. And where there are engineering companies that maybe aren't yet bought into it, um, I want the engineering institutes to start, um, you know, shifting that. Um, and the things that I thought engineering institutes could do would be to have diversity and inclusion as part of their approved corporate partner program. Um, so some, some institutes have bronze, silver, gold. You know, if you're a gold member, then you have, you know, you, 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 you've satisfied X, Y, and Z. Why don't we bring in a new platinum level or gold plus um, that has a point on diversity and inclusion? Um, annual award ceremonies have a diversity and inclusion annual award at your award ceremonies. Um, and just generally for institutes to uphold diversity and inclusion values as they expand globally across geographies. 
um, it's, it's crucially important that if you are an engineer working in a small business that doesn't have, a, a, you're not part of a large employer that might have an employee resource group, that you can be equally supported. Um, and in my view, the Engineering Institute is the first port of call for that. So you should have an organization that you can call upon for help. Um, and that's something they can uh, plug. And then again, survey. Survey the global membership. Let's get an idea of what's going on outside the UK and also in other geographies. And then for the government, well, I think the government should um, encourage and pu uh, engineering institutes and companies to publish best practice guidance specifically for engineering. Now, this report was written actually just before the launch of the fantastic diversity toolkit that the team at the Academy have put a lot of effort into. So would strongly encourage you to um, take away because a lot of the things that we've recommended here are in there as well and there's actual case studies to go along with them which can help with implementation. Um, for the government to be more active in promoting diversity and inclusion, um, implement the supply chain requirements, that's a really strong thing there. Um, collect data on the workforce on invisible minorities um, and just generally be more supportive uh, be more vocal in supporting LGBT engineers. So, I thought I would bring all this to life with some quotes from emails um, that we have received from LGBT engineers in need of help and support. These are ex these are the exact people with whom we at Interengineering as an organisation serve to support. So the first one is from a school student from Canada who got in touch and he said, I will be starting my studies in civil engineering this coming September. I have been so intrigued about the couple of articles you have written on this matter because I just recently came out and I have been bombarded with negativity from my parents about the issue and it has scared me from the fact that I am gay and will jeopardise my career. Well, if that student's not able to Google what's it like being an LGBT engineer and didn't find content, he might have chosen to go and study something else. And there's a valuable civil engineer in the future that we've lost. From an engineer in the UK, I shall shortly be facing a rather pressing dilemma as my own project nears its construction phase in Saudi Arabia. An assignment on the job would have very tangible benefits to my career and plug some gaps in my professional experience. However, when talking to colleagues about its implications for me personally, it was not an issue that had been considered at all. So this comes down to living in a heteronormative society, people just generally not understanding, right? not even coming on radar if you've not been educated that these could be issues. And then the third one, I paraphrased slightly at the beginning because it was a long, heartfelt email and I, had, I felt quite heavy after I'd read this. Um, and so just to set the scene for this guy's concerns, um, coming out at work for him was a big deal. He was not possible to control, he was concerned that it was not possible for him to control how fast and wide the news would spread and did not feel ready for certain members of his family to know. <coughs> he was concerned of the impact that this might have on his authority, respect, street cred, with relationships with fellow operators and longer term career prospects. And so it was the first time or second time I think he'd ever told anyone or an entity that he's gay. And he finished off with, finally, having kept this part of me hidden for so long, I find myself in a situation not too indifferent to events explained by Cogmire theory. That is, the excuses and harmless untruths over time have in a sense defined my identity in a way. I felt the longer it has gone on, the more difficult it has become to reveal it as a falsehood to close families and friends. And he actually finished off by saying, I don't really know what I expected <coughs> to achieve by writing this email, but would appreciate a response somehow. So if we've just been an organization for him to just offload into, um, and he feels better after that, then you know, I'm happy with it. 